the gentleman that I'd like to introduce next uh, isn't around YouTube a lot, so I thought it'd be great to get him on here and have a conversation. I met him while recording the clinics for the National NMRA convention that's coming up on July 6th. He will be one of the presenters, and his presentation is going to be on kit bashing. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, Don, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and kind of how you got into model railroading and how long you've been doing it and uh, just just a little bit about who you are. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, so I've, uh, like, like most guys uh, my age, I had a Lionel when I was a kid and, uh, and all that, but uh, but really I haven't been a lifelong modeler. Uh, like a lot of guys I talked to, uh, got into other things and work and all that stuff. But uh, uh, when my kids were little, I got out, the, I got on the Brio trains and uh, tried to generate an interest in trains, but uh, none of them seemed interested. And until the very last kid, um, he was interested. So we went to train shows and uh, we uh, started building a layout and then a bigger layout and then a bigger layout. And, um did a lot of good things but uh he got older and he moved on and decided that was uh, for kids i guess but uh, by that time i was addicted to the uh to the modeling so um that's what i've been doing so i've been uh back into the hobby for about uh, a little over 10 years i guess is what it is but uh i've been uh, uh doing a lot of modeling lately so i retired five years ago and uh, shortly after that, we uh, we built a house, moved to uh, San Antonio, and uh, I've got my own custom layout room there, which is uh, which is pretty nice. Can't complain. A small a small uh, little room, from what I understand, right? A, a, a small room. It's it's uh, it's only twenty percent larger than my first house. Yeah. So uh, so just to put it in perspective, yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> it's it's pretty nice. So I've been working on that. I'm also the uh, director of the uh, NMRA Division Six, which uh, encompasses uh, 48 counties uh, centered basically on San Antonio. And so I, it keeps me a little bit busy as well. So that's uh, that's it. I'm retired uh, mechanical engineer, and uh, I s uh, spend uh, almost every day out in the lab. One thing that we were talking about that I thought was kind of interesting uh, before we get into kit bashing is that you don't consider yourself a modeler. You're more of a builder or something. I, this, was, this was kind of an interesting conversation in that, like, defining what model railroading is, I think, is an interesting conversation. Um, and I'm actually, we're going to be talking a lot more about that on the next Modeling Monday. But in relationship to you, you you sort of volunteered that you don't consider yourself a modeler. Well, it depends on how you define it, but uh, yeah, like I, I, I briefly touched on, I'm not a lifelong modeler. And uh, so when I was a kid, you know, when I was eight or 10, I would go down to the YMCA on Saturday mornings and uh, they had swimming and you could play pool and you could, uh, uh, you could build models and that kind of thing. So I built models. Uh, Oh, maybe as many as half a dozen. And I, I got the whole tube of glue all over the windshield of this car. And uh, yeah. I thought I was doing pretty well until I looked to the kid to the left and my kid to the right. They had beautiful models built. And uh, and uh, I finally decided modeling wasn't for me, and I gave up and moved on to other things. But uh, uh, so now I'm back in the hobby. And, uh, and, you know, what I find interesting about this hobby is there's so many different aspects of it. You know, there's electronics and gizmos, and there's track lane, and there's bench work building, and there's planning and designing, and uh, uh, you know, programming logos, and, uh, and and there's a lot of parts to it that are not really, you know, the kind of modeling that you guys uh, hunkered over your bench work, your 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 work tables there are doing. So, um, yeah, I'm finding more and more. I, I I'm interested in being a good modeler, and I'm aspiring to be a better modeler and uh and uh i work on uh, i work on things quite a bit but uh i'm not to that level of, of the people i see here in the uh, in the group today so i yeah i'm not a 
I'm not a natural modeler. Don't take any modeling tips from me. So, oh, but uh, I think but, what Steve eighty seven P Snap says: if you make modelers, you're a modeler, and I kind of agree with that. I I, I consider myself a bit beginner modeler, yet I've kind of started this modeling Monday stream, and you know, I get on here and I kind of model in front of people, and we talk about things. We talk about how we can improve them, how we can make them better, but. Uh, I don't think skill level necessarily doesn't make you a modeler, but I I underst I do understand what you're saying as well. Yeah, and, and part of the modeling I really like is, is following the prototype and uh, mm. uh, doing doing the history, doing the research, uh, figuring out what your what your model should look like, um, trying to figure out how I'm going to build them, and, and that's you know where kit bashing comes in is how how am I going to build a model using Using the parts and the kits I have available, how can I make a model of this particular building that uh, doesn't really have a uh, model kit built for it? So I, I really enjoy that part of it. I uh, I was just at a guy's layout yesterday, and uh, you know, not to say anything about uh, about model power, uh, but uh, he, he had a he had a stack of model power kits, and I'm thinking, hey. you yeah. know, if I'm going to build a model, I, I want I want to start out with a, with a chance of it, you know, being being a good model, and and one I'm I'm proud of. And uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, we all uh, we all uh, end up saying, "Well, that's good enough." At some point, you say, "You know, two things: it, that's good enough, and it's my railroad." So, so that's where I stop. Yep, exactly. Rule number one: it's my railroad. So, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um. You've mentioned kit bashing, which is what I've titled this, and that is what you you ended up doing a forty five minute presentation on kit bashing. How did you? How did that kind of become your thing? Like, like kit bashing was it? Was it by choice? Is it something you went after, or did it just sort of happen along the way? Well, it's it's something like I say. I model, so I model the. Uh, we didn't talk about what I model. I model the Burlington. Uh, the CB&Q in uh, 1966. I'm uh, I'm from Aurora, Illinois. Both uh, both the Burlington and myself were born in Aurora, Illinois. So for those that don't know about Aurora, Aurora was uh, at least back in the day, as we say, it was uh, was quite a manufacturing town, and uh, there was there was a lot going on. Uh, so Caterpillar has has just moved out of town. Uh, but uh, industries like that, there were a lot of heavy equipment industries. There were a lot of uh, metalworking industries, um, and then of course they had all the all the other things, the uh, uh, coal and oil and, and other things that were delivered. So there were there were perhaps a uh, hundred industries that uh, would be switched by the railroad every day uh, in Aurora back uh, back in the day. So um, as I uh, uh, my original vision is my railroad would, would go from Aurora all the way into Chicago, and I'd model Union Station, and mm -hmm. and fortunately somebody talked me down off the ledge on that and said, uh, Don, Don, hold, you, you might want to scale scale back a little bit, and uh, thank God I did. So uh, right now my uh, the main level of my layout is, is basically just Aurora, and so it's switching all those industries. And there's several branch lines so within town, and I've got one branch line that goes out of town. Do you have uh, but, some? Uh, uh, did you pull any photos out? Do you do you have some photos to share? Do you want to do that now of your layout? Yeah, and, we can uh, we can do that. Let me. Uh, did a virtual layout tour a few months ago, so I'm uh, I'm pulling from that. Uh, so this is uh, what I did. We found a, uh, a builder and a, a lot that we liked. Um, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, the good news, bad news, it's a very nice neighborhood. Um, and they, they only built like four bedroom houses, which is, you know, fine for the two of us. So I took uh, I took something called game room, a media room, bedroom four, bathroom four. Uh, there's a wet bar area. Um, I took all those. I added a little bit of square footage on. I rearranged everything until I ended up with this train room, which is just over uh, 1,000 square feet. And I took the half bath and I moved that over. I claimed that with that with my train room. And I took the, the one car garage and made that into my shop. And that has a uh, 
Uh, I got some good advice along the way. I, I put in a four and a half foot wide door uh, into my shop so I can carry really big things in there. Um, I've got an outside entrance for uh, my visitors, like like you guys, so that uh, all you creepy guys don't have to be paraded through the living room when my wife's in her in her jammies. So that, that's her favorite part of the layout is that that exterior door for you guys. I did a few things while I was planning. I put in some ceiling outlets so I could uh, string some uh, some lights of uh, my own choosing. I got floor outlets. Um, I got uh, all the outlets are uh, switched, so I can uh, when I leave the room, I have these lighted uh, uh, switches. Uh, so when I leave, I can shut everything down. So any soldering iron or glue gun I've got plugged in is off. The uh, Locomotive that stalled out on the switch has been uh, depowered, and uh, it's it's a real good way to uh, uh, keep control over those things. I can't complain, you know. So this is my this is my retirement home, and uh, yeah, that's awesome. I, uh, yep. it's it's uh, it's it's uh, very yeah. I can't believe my wife let me get away with this, but uh, um, her her thing was it had to be a new house, and, and part of her thing on that is so she can pick out all the all the flooring and curtains and whatever, you know, she, yeah. plus she doesn't like, she watches all those home improvement shows where you find out that the rot and everything else has, has gotten, you know, taken over the house. But uh, the other thing was we had to be within 15 minutes of our granddaughter. So, wow. so she was happy once, uh, once I had those checked off and, uh, and I got my train room, but uh, yeah, my first house in California was 820 square feet. And this is uh, just over a thousand square feet have some uh, design and engineering background that kind of helped uh, guide these uh, decisions? Yeah, the, uh, I've been the engineer, uh, mechanical engineer. I uh, worked for uh, 39 years, mostly for Peterbilt. See, if I move out of the way, you can see the big, big Peterbilt behind me here. Um, and so that's one of the uh, truck models I worked on. And so that... Uh, uh, that's where the uh, funding came, shall we say, for uh, for this house, and so that worked out pretty well. I I'll tell you a little side story since we've got plenty of time. The uh, the uh, we focused on this uh, on my PowerPoint here with the uh, with the view of the uh, uh, this view. I was I was standing in the room right about the I think about right the same day I took this picture, and they'd. Uh, or, yeah, you know, they'd finished the drywall, they just painted it, and I was standing there, I was just kind of breathing in train room. You know, oh, this could be so awesome. And I was and I just I was standing here right at this view, and, and all of a sudden I, I feel a presence behind beside me, and and it's it's not one of the workers, it's it's uh, apparently one of the neighbors. Is and he and he and he turns to me and says, I know what's going on here, and I'm gonna put a stop to it. This cannot happen in this neighborhood. And so, you know, so I said, well, I'm going to play along. So I said, wow, what's, what's going on here? I said, he says, you, you can't see what this guy's doing? Look at these floor outlets. You know what they're for? I said, no, what are they for? And they said, this guy is going to set up some kind of telemarketing distribution thing. He's going to have like 20 or 25 people in this room. There's going to be cars parked up and down this street. That is, we are not zoned for that. I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to go to the HOA today, and I'm going to I'm going to put a stop to this right now. I said, "Wow." I said, "You know, when I look at this room, I don't think that's what this guy's going to do." He says, "You don't? What do you think he's going to do?" I said, "I bet he's going to have a, a big model railroad." He goes, "What?" <laughs> I was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've heard of. I said, hi, I'm Don. This is my model railroad. <laughs> <laughs> I, awesome. I never saw the guy again. The nice thing is that we, we decided we're, we're, none of us are getting any younger. So it's, uh, I thought I was going to end up with a basement, but uh, we don't have basements in San Antonio like, like many parts of the country. This is, uh, we're in a uh, limestone quarry country. So I had, uh, when they started my house, there was absolutely no dirt on the property. It was solid limestone wow. down as, as far as you can imagine. So uh, there's no basement. But uh, that's fine because when I'm, when I'm uh, you know, being pushed around in my wheelchair, I can still get to my layout room uh, pretty easily. So that so works out. 
My, my wife's okay. vision was to have a uh, outbuilding. Yeah, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. In, case of, in case of a fire or something, I said, yeah, that's a good idea, because if the house burns down, I don't want the layout to burn. <laughs> And, uh, and I don't uh, think that's what she meant. She, I don't think that's what she, she didn't mean, but but it's better having it attached. I can walk out there with my first cup of coffee and just wander around and see what I'm going to work on today. Yeah, so that's my layout two and a half years. So, two and a half years, what what have I done? So, um, yeah, I got uh, I got about 70 or 80 percent of the track leg, uh, a lot oh, of the awesome. staging. Um, let's see, I'm showing, uh, yeah, I've, I've been working a lot on staging, you know, if you're going to put in staging and it's going to be underneath the layout, you want to get it in early. So, so yeah, what you see in, in this part of the room, uh, the top level, the main level where the interesting things are going to happen, structures and scenery go as it's not here yet, but I've got, uh, 10 tracks of, uh, two levels of 10 track staging. I've got uh, enough staging for 1,600 cars or 47 trains, depending on how you break it out. So this is one of my branch lines that's, that's still within town, and uh, uh, it's actually the area of town where I lived in. So it's, uh, um, that's pretty well done. We've already actually started operating on that. We go back to my, uh, my Oregon slide, the... Uh, um, this is my staging, so there's really no operations there. But I decided I could sneak I could sneak in enough room to put in the depot, and that way, uh, uh, what I've seen on other layouts that I like is as your train goes through staging, you lose track of it, you know, and there's there's nothing to see. So I can I can sneak in kind of a bonus scene here on on Oregon, and uh, I've got another bonus scene here. I got the the town of Sandwich, Illinois, what? is represented. Down here, Thomas from uh, Split Rock <laughs> is trying to get us back on track a little bit here. He's asking, uh, "What era sure. is the layout you're modeling?" Uh, 1966. Uh, so it's the uh, uh, it's the diesel era. I don't. Uh, I'm old, but I'm still too young to remember uh, steam engines uh, anywhere in town. I was, uh, you know, the dieselization uh, was kind of complete by the time I was born in 1954. So uh, I don't bother modeling steam except the, I, in fact, I picked the year 66. One, one reason is we still had two locomotives preserved uh, on the railroad that were used for uh, excursions. So I've, uh, I wanted to model those. I thought we'd talk a little bit about kit bashing today, and I think we'll, we'll get to that now, then maybe come back to your layout. So, so what is kit bashing? How did you get into it? And uh, why, why do you like doing it? If you're going to model a prototype, then you you have some buildings that uh, uh, you know you, you want to model, and you want to you want to make them look like they're supposed to look. And uh, Walther's doesn't make a kit that does what you want to do, so you have to do something else, and you have to you have to be a little creative and uh, and figure out how I'm going to take pieces from this kit. Um, usually, I, I just keep it with the same kit, but uh, sometimes I'm combining. Uh, several kits, and you, you try to see if you can you can get that to uh, uh, do what you want it to do. Uh, and so I've I've been doing that. I've been uh, I, I split my time. I've always got about uh, twenty or or so things that I can work on any any given day. And uh, so sometimes I'm laying track, sometimes I'm uh, building structures. Um, and so I I kind of trade off to keeps things interesting. But I was I've been building a lot of structures. And uh, uh, trying to get it, uh, you know, really makes the layout take take some shape when you can see what, what uh, how it's coming along. But uh, uh, about a year ago, I was uh, we were having a local Zoom meeting, um, and they were looking for material, somebody to do a presentation on what they've been working on. And I said, well, I've been doing a lot of kit bashing, so I slapped together a few slides and did something, and then I, uh, I. Uh, Presented that again a few months later, and then I decided to expand it into a full-blown clinic. Uh, not that I'm the, uh, the world expert on kit bashing, uh, but uh, you know, I, I looked at it and said, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't know, or, or really, I think my clinic talks a lot about, you know, go ahead, um, go outside the box. You can color outside the lines. It's it's okay. 
uh, make it your own. It's, Walther's doesn't, once you buy it and pay the guy the money, Walther's doesn't own that kit anymore. And, uh, and you do what you want with it. And uh, the slide we're looking at now is actually from uh, uh, David Pop ran a series a year ago uh, where he gave everybody a uh, one kit and he said, uh, make something other than what it's supposed to be and uh, use your creativity. So they came up with all these different things. And, and really, I think that's the key to kit bashing is, is uh, get some inspiration and uh, remake it into something that you want it to be, something that you need for your layout. So these, the, it, I'm, I'm looking at it now and I'm, I'm picking it out, but that, that one front wall is in every kit, but it's like it's in a different position and it makes it look like a completely different building. I didn't get that until you actually said that. Yeah, it, it, and it's amazing what you can do. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the gas station, that's, you know, the, the uh, fire station. Holy cow, how many small towns have you driven through where that's the fire station? You know, Walther's, Walther's missed the boat on that, but that's, they, should, they should relabel it as, a, uh, as that. Um, see, somebody's asking which kit uh, was this? Was that the question? Can't well, quite. Steve 87 PSAP saying, how many state line buildings did you buy? Um, <laughs> oh, how many did I buy? Yeah. Um, I, don't know. I don't know how many David bought. He bought the. Uh, but he bought one for everybody on the staff. Um, if you watch the video series, he talks to each one of the staff members and asks, you know, how they got their ideas and how they built it. And uh, he went to the managing uh, editor. Uh, his name escapes me now. Uh, the big boss. And uh, he went into his office and said, how, how's your kid coming along? And he, he says, here it is. It's still in the cellophane. And he throws it back across the room. Yeah. He says, I don't have time for this. Do you use a lot of Walther's kits or do you kind of just use anybody's kits? I, I use anybody's. Um, I was, let me get let me back to the question we had a, a minute ago. Uh, I, I did finally, it was, it was sometime later, but I did finally build something with this kit. Uh, I bought two kits and made it into my, uh, my uh, Lawndale enameling factory, which, uh, which was, uh, you know, an eclectic, series of peak roofs and dome the dome group got me going on it but there's flat roofs and peak roofs and dome roofs and uh it's kind of a nondescript building uh that that you know no one's really going to remember so i can so i have even though i'm modeling the prototype i take some freelance license and say well uh you know i need something that has a lot of dock doors and i want that dome roof and uh so yeah i can i can make something out of that one thing I, I looked at on, on this structure here, though, is uh, uh, so when I when I go operating uh, layouts, you know, you you come to a, a section of a layout that the guy has, and uh, he has all these industries lined up, and they're smaller than a 40-foot boxcar. You have to get a 40-foot boxcar of stuff every day delivered to him. <laughs> and and that, that kind of makes me crazy. Um, so, you know, when I build a structure, if, if I have the room, you know, I try to... And not not exactly fill up the space, but you know, it needs to have a plausible story on why it's getting one or two box cars of, of stuff because you know you need a lot of room for your manufacturing. Uh, you know, I was in manufacturing for years, so you know you need a lot of space, and uh, and I like to you know let it fill up that space. But I did all this with two kits, and you know I don't I don't need two of the walls, so I just filled those in with the. Uh, I don't, can't remember if I filled them in or just propped them up, but uh, um, you know, kit bashing can be really economical. That's that's one of the things I talk about briefly in my clinic is you know, you, you can save uh, money if you spread out your kits and uh, and get more out of them than than Walther's. You know, Walther's has you build a tr uh, rectangle, and uh, you typically don't need all those walls, and you can you can use the pieces to uh, to make your building larger. One of the other things that I like that you talked about um, and that we sort of joked about after we recorded your presentation is um, I've modeled the Walther's Merchants Row and you go on everybody's layout and you see that everyone's got Walther's Merchants Row on their layout. And I like that you talked about how, you know, using kit bashing and even just changing the name of a building 
to make it something different than what Walther sends you out of the box. Um, you know, to make your layout a little different. Yeah. I mean, you got to, uh, Tony Custer says, don't read the label on the box because Walters is always putting the wrong label on them, which is yeah. just his tongue in cheek uh, line. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, look, look at what's in there. Don't look at the name because the name will throw you off every time. So what's what's one of your favorite uh, kit bashes, Doc? My favorite? Wow, I don't know if I have a favorite. They all, uh, you know, they all take shape, and uh, I get them built, and then I move on. Um, I guess I guess this maybe uh, maybe this one here. The uh, uh, I had a yard office. I have uh, two known photos of it, and uh, the guys that worked there. The building's gone, of course. This is the Eola yard office. My friend from Downers Grove will, might recognize Eola. That's where the, uh, when the, uh, it's funny if you look at the history of railroads, is, uh, you know, when, when they get started, the, uh, the city fathers are, are begging the railroad to come to town. They'll, they'll offer them money and bribes and whatever to get the railroad to, to come to their town because they don't want to be the town without a railroad. And uh, they, they put a depot and, uh, and a yard down in the center of town and, and all that stuff. And then, uh, you know, 20, 30, 50 years later, they go like, why do we have this stinking railroad in the middle of our downtown? Whose idea was that? And uh, so so that, that happened in Aurora. And, uh, and so everything was right downtown. They, uh, they were forced to do two things. They had to uh, uh, do a grade separation and put a, uh, a viaduct through town. To get it off the streets, and then they had to take the yard and move it uh, uh, several miles east of town uh, to a little, uh, tiny little village called Eola. And uh, BNSF still has a, a fairly large yard there. Uh, but the uh, the yard office, um, I've got a couple pictures of it, and uh, I had enough information to draw a uh, an outline of what the building looked like. And I put it on my layout there to make sure it fit. I had the, I've got the yard built. Um, but the thing that really uh, slowed me down was I went to get the material. And it's fairly common. I mean, you've seen buildings like this, right? It's called it the uh, Butler Building kind of uh, construction with uh, metal panels. And uh, I couldn't find anybody that made those. And I, I found it in this Walther's Guard Shack kit. And... Uh, Fortunately, the windows in the kit are pretty close to the same dimensions as my windows, uh, be, which is good because there's not a lot of uh, blank material with the kit. I bought three of the kits. I, I put the uh, one of the things that I, I talk about in my clinic is before you start cutting and gluing and find out it's not going to work, uh, just put the parts in your copy machine and uh, and build it that way. And so I figured out I was going to need three kits to build this. I, I printed them on different colors of paper so I could keep track of where I was. I needed 13 different wall sections. And uh, I got that figured out. I need some more roofing. I, you always need more roofing when you're kit bashing because you're not building that rectangle that Walther's wants. And, uh, and oftentimes I'm, I'm expanding, or in this case, building three kits. But uh, uh, it's one of the nice things about this material is it has a lot of seams and that's where you can hide how it goes together. So I had uh, five sections of wall just to make up this, this little wall section here and uh, was able to get it glued together and put together. And it's, it's pretty darn close to the actual structure as far as I can tell from two photographs. Um, and uh, having the different roofing material is, actually works out because the story you're telling is that you know this was the original uh, section of the yard office and they expanded out to here and they expanded this thing that that joins on to the rpo that's out there for a locker room and then they added on this this porch here has asphalt symbols and so it has a lot of variety it has a lot of character and uh, that's one of the things i find interesting in, in building these is is you know, you can you can kind of tell a story just by the way you build it. 
do you buy the kits that you're buying uh, with the intention that you know what you're going to kit build them for? Or are you a, uh, we'll say, a collector of kits um, that, that you just have a closet full and you go through your closet uh, when you're ready to make something? Well, it, it, it's both. Um, one of the things that I, I do a lot now is uh, uh, when I go shopping for a kit, if I have a specific idea, I, I know what this uh, prototype is supposed to be, I'll go shopping. I'll just I'll just Google H.O. Walther structures, and uh, not that I use exclusively Walthers, but you know they are the they are the big animal in the, in the market. So uh, I go there first, and uh, and I just scroll through, and I keep looking at I'm looking at architectural style. I'm looking at the size, the shape, you know, the aspect ratios, and uh, the material, whether it's brick or, or metal, wood. And uh, and try to find something that I think that I can uh, you know make something out of. Uh, so that's what I do most of the time. But on the other hand, I was at the uh, uh, I was at the Houston uh, train show uh, a year ago, and I came across a table that was uh, uh, basically an estate sale. So these guys were helping out the widow. Uh, they cleaned out this guy's closet after he died, and, uh, and they have, you know, like two truckloads full of uh, kits that he never built. And they, they put them out there for a good price, and uh, I bought I bought dozens of them, thinking that this is going to be uh, material, you know. You know, like the, the Walther's uh, big uh, uh, paper mill. I said, well, I need a lot of big factories, so that I can use that. And I bought the, uh, I bought the slaughterhouse, and I bought the... Uh, a number of buildings that I that I thought I might need with without really knowing what I was going to do because you know you gotta you gotta buy them when you're there at the show and uh, I can't come back later so I, I do both. Are there uh, we've talked about Walters? Are there other manufacturers that like that are go to uh, for various part, pieces and parts for you? Um, you know, and Tony Custer talks about that. Don't don't ignore the uh, the German manufacturers. You know, they have a lot of nice uh, kits. Um, you know, the, the challenge with those is they have very, you know, German looking architectural styles. You know, with with all the with all the swoop de doos and uh, and and different things. And uh, you know, very very few of them look like uh, a building that you might see in Aurora, Illinois. In the 60s, so uh, whereas the Walthers uh, are much closer and uh, and look more normal, so but yeah, the Walthers used to make a, a DPM knockoff too, and uh, I've actually used quite a few of these. You can still get them out there on eBay in the train shows, and uh, yeah, I built this uh, this structure here out of uh, out of DPM, and and I like that they have templates. So you can you can use those and uh, figure out what you're going to do before again before you cut any plastic. Although the slide I, I pulled up here is is I think this is key uh, for people that uh, if there's anybody on the call here that it's a little, little timid about scratch building. What I I walk through six different ways to uh, kind of define your project, and uh, and I I think this is really important for people starting kit bashing is is you know oh my gosh how do i how do you get started and how do you how do you know what to do and uh and so you you've got to you know you could make a stand in structure this this uh depot moves all over my layout it's, it's been the oregon depot and the, and the wedron depot and uh and uh, yeah it's sheridan depot and it moves around but uh you know building a mock-up building a template um you know those are those are real and the tape up I use a lot of tape ups. You know, I I, I see where I'm going. At. So I just uh, yeah. So I tape at the tape up stage. I've already committed to opening up the box and uh, breaking the seal. Uh, but uh, but then I'll I'll tape the walls together, and and I'll just look at it. In all of these, I'll typically set them up with a stand in or a mock up or tape up, and I'll 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 put them there, and I'll be walking around the lab room. For maybe a week or more, and and go like, yeah, yeah, that looks right. You know what it needs? You know, it needs to be a little longer, or maybe I need to cut off the second floor, or maybe, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I'll 
I'll get the, you know, or I'll decide, no, that's, that's going to be good. I like, I like how that looks. And, and then once I've got that set, then I'll move on and actually start, you know, cutting and gluing. Nice. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the tough step is, is deciding what you're going to do. And, uh, in a way it's the tough step, but I, but I think it's the most fun. Well, yeah, I think with kit bashing, you know, the, the first thing is how, how big does this thing need to be? How big can it be? Uh, what shape can it be? You know, your, your tracks are, are, uh, seldom parallel where you want to put that building. They're, they're converging into a switch or they're crossing back and forth. And, uh, and so you've got some, you got some odd angles and, uh, so maybe it needs to be longer, but, but shallower, um, uh, you know, maybe you don't have the space for the uh, the kit as Walter's design. Maybe it doesn't look right. Uh, you know, my example of my uh, actually it's here on the screen. My my power plant uh, I needed for this uh, for the Austin Western facility. Um, you know, I looked at uh, Walter's and uh, and others make about a half dozen different things they call you know coal fired power plants, and uh, and none of them look like this building. Uh, this building looks you know, as as I as I show, it looks just like that uh, canning uh, uh, factory, the the one that you're building on your uh, diorama. It's the uh, it's the canning company, and uh, and so that's what I used to build mine. But uh, I uh, and then I cut off a section of it and got it to where it you know looked more like the structure I wanted to model. Do you ever end up building something and then just like completely taking it apart to build something else? Or do you, once you build it, you try and like figure out a way to use it as it is? Now, when I, when I moved and well, I toured, I had a, I had a layout in my fire house and uh, I had a couple of them. And now when I moved, I, uh, I sold like every structure I had to this one guy for a hundred bucks. And, uh, he was, okay. he was all excited about it. And, uh, I got rid of, almost everything because then uh by the time i moved uh it, it took me you know a couple of years to actually move but which is good because in that time i was able to do a third planet drawing of the entire layout uh i could figure out what i'm doing i'm committed to modeling the burlington uh with these industries and uh and so when I start looking at my structures, you know, I've got the uh, the Walther's Champion Packing Company uh, meat packing plant, and I've got the uh, I have the uh, a, a lot of you know interstate fuel and oil. And yeah, okay, I admit I used to build kits the way the way Walther's wanted me to build them. So I'm uh, I've reformed since then. But uh, so yeah, I had all these kits, uh, a lot of them built, uh, and uh, I just got rid of them all. And uh, so I'm starting over from scratch. So I don't rebuild them, but but yeah, I do repurpose a lot of things. Um, if I could, uh, let me let me go to this page. Uh, in my clinic, I talk about this. So, so Walt, uh, Tony Custer tells you don't don't read the uh, the box title, and and so I, I read that, but then I uh, but I fall into the trap. Uh, it's so easy to do. So, so a guy came to our, our breakfast meeting and said, uh, Don, here's, here's something I, I haven't been able to sell at the train show. Nobody, nobody, Don, wants an NMRA headquarters building model. He says, he says Don, I can't even give it away. And he, 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 he held it out, put it in my hand, and uh, they pulled his hand away. And, uh, and so then uh, I had it. And I didn't know what to do with it. So uh, it just sat there in my, my closet full of kits. And uh, uh, I had nothing to do. So, so then later, I was, I was trying to model this area here. I said, what, what am I going to do? I decided to make it a kid's area at the bottom of my helix. I want some kids to be able to play with trains down here. Because if they're playing down here at a two-foot level, which is perfect for them, they, they'll be less likely to be messing up my railroad uh, up up where I care about. So I, I rebuilt the thing. Uh, so this is what it's supposed to look like. And, uh, you know, this is where I went with it. Would painting something in a different way also be considered kit bashing? Or is that just, is that just painting? Um, I call it, uh, I, I mentioned that briefly in my, uh, my clinic. Yeah. 
flip a page on that. I, I call it kit dis disguising. I, I just made that up. I don't know if that's a, there's a good word for it, but uh, what I, I think that's key. Uh, you know, the last thing I want to do is to is to build a kit and then paint it. Well, well, don't paint it and then put on the Centennial Mills uh, decal on it so everybody knows that I've built the Walther Centennial Mills kit because uh, there's a lot of them out there. And uh, I was putting this together for my uh, my clinic, and then I, I read in Model Railroader uh, uh, one of their featured layout uh, tours uh, in June was a guy, and he had the, he had the Centennial Mills thing uh, uh, unpainted right out of the box, the Centennial Mills. Uh, decal on it and the whole bit. So, um, which is fine. It's your railroad, uh, but uh, pro problem I have is, is just just mentally when I walk into your layout and room and and I see those Centennial Mills and there's Champion Packing and and then I my mind wanders onto a game of what to see how many Walters kits I can find. Yeah, and and you're trying to portray some railroad the. The, the Johnson and Eastern Railroad or something. And and the illusion gets lost immediately if, if it looks like uh, it's just a Walther's sales display. So um, yeah, I think I think if you paint it, if you use different decals, um, I think you know that can that can uh, spruce it up right away and you keep it from uh, looking as much like that. You know, the other thing you can do, uh, and I talk about the, uh, you know, Use, use your own uh, uh, signage and then uh, paint it a different color. Walters doesn't think you're going to paint it. But also, sometimes these highly detailed kits like Centennial Mills, you know, leave off the fire escape and the dust collectors. And now it looks like a generic factory warehouse. Um, and it, it's not screaming uh, Centennial Mills uh, when, you, when you do that. And, and so that's one of my goals. Is, is I don't want anything to look like a Walther's kit. You know, it's, it's going to take you a long time to figure out which Walther's kit I used uh, if I've done it right. Oh, there you go. There's a challenge for Don Wynn's layout tour is <laughs> spot the Walther's. How many Walther's kits can you name when taking a tour of Don Wynn's layout? Where does 3D printing fit into all that kit bashing and stuff? Because it is, it's like you can take the prototype, 3D scan it and print it out and have like a almost a perfect replica and you don't don't even need to kit bash anymore. I, I agree. You know, if, uh, you know, 3D printing's great, but you, you've got to have somebody that uh, goes and figures out the dimensions and makes the drawing and uh, so there's, there's there's a process there. A lot of people are really into that. Uh, I have not gotten into that. That's a that's a, another uh, another facet of the hobby, uh, it, which again is is a great thing on our hobby. Is there's so many different things you can do. But I agree. If I had uh, you know somebody could build 3D printed kits for me uh, to build all my structures, I, I would definitely go that way. But uh, that'd be like the budget for the uh, for the. Uh, then ever for the California Zephyr, you know, he's like, I don't, I don't know what would cost me to do that. Well, Anthony Dodge uh, got into 3D printing, I think, fairly recently, and he says he has 13 3D printed buildings that would have cost between 25 and 75 dollars each. So let's say 750 bucks, right? 75 times 10, let's say. Um, but his printer cost is 400 bucks plus 25 in filament. So you'd be at 750 for a bunch of kits that you then have to build and whatever versus 425 for a printer and filament. So it is, I think, depending on the volume uh, you're printing, it's... Uh, uh, so, Don, if, if people want to find you, uh, what's a good way to kind of see what you're up to? Um, we discussed the NMRA National Convention. Oh, convention. You're going to be doing a presentation. But outside of that, uh, what's a, do you have a Facebook page or any of that kind of thing? That... I do. I do. I'm, uh, uh, so I don't do Facebook. So uh, if you want to be my friend, uh, don't be insulted if I uh, refuse. Um, but uh, I do have a fellow Burlington modeler that talked me into um, developing a Facebook group uh, focused on my railroad. 
it, it's I, I kind of adopt the it's my railroad thing again on my Facebook group. So the Facebook group is for if no one else, it's for me. And I do uh, monthly uh, postings uh, to talk about what I did uh, this past month. So this is the last day of the month. So I have to uh, start writing up what did I work on. And uh, uh, coming from a uh, you know situation where I had to do monthly reports every month for 35 years, yeah. um, I, 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 I somehow can't get out of that. It, it's, it's totally ingrained in my head that I have to do a monthly report and and justify uh, my existence. Uh, so, so I do that, uh, but it's really good because then it's a, it's a documentation for me on, you know, what sometimes I'll refer back to my own Facebook group and, uh, and, and check that out to see how I, I did a particular thing. It, it's, it's more like a diary. It's just called the Aurora Division. Um, and uh, so it's a closed group. Go ahead and go ahead and send a request and uh, uh, remind me who you are and uh, and how you know me uh, because I I don't uh, I try to screen the strangers uh. so yeah I talk about things like I, I'm picking out a new paint for my fascia and uh, I'll talk about you know what I've completed on track and what I've completed on structures uh, and all that uh, uh, whatever I've done this month you're a rattle can guy not a airbrush guy. Well, I, yeah, there's some other guys I, I hang around with. They say, yeah, I don't, I don't have, my life's too short to uh, spend time cleaning airbrushes. But uh, it, it depends, depends on what I'm doing. If, if I'm building a contest uh, AP model, then, you know, I'll go to the airbrush and try and get it working. I'm not a good airbrusher. I just like I'm not a good modeler. But if I'm, if I'm just hit, hit bashing something, uh, you know, the, the rattle can does a pretty good job. You know, it doesn't have the the fine uh, detail that uh, uh, you you want in a in a beautiful uh, award-winning model. But uh, you know, I need I need somewhere around two through three hundred structures for this layout, and uh, and I can't spend time. This is an interesting project. I I, I uh, was looking at how to put my uh, caterpillar tractors on my flat cars and uh, magnets. Magnets is the way to go. Uh, okay. Because yeah, now I can. I'm like, I can, are you I can, holding it upside down? I'm like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm uh, so I can come in with an empty flat car, and uh, between operating sessions, I can go and put all my uh, tractors on the flat cars, push them back into the caterpillar plant, and uh, you pull them out and uh, send them on their way. So uh, cool. yeah, that's working out. So that was that's a fun side project. This is this is the area where I'm working right now. In fact, I've got a picture up on my screen. If you want to share that, that's what I've actually worked on in the last uh, uh, few days. Um, can you share my? There we go. So I'm uh, I'm I'm doing the rough scenery on my helix. I haven't gotten into any scenery yet, but uh, um, I've got uh, trying to trying to dress up my helix. And I just got some fascia on there, and wow, it's it's really incredible. Uh, how a fascia changes the view because mm. you know up until this point it was just a, a six layer uh, helix that it looks kind of like a mess but uh, um, so I kit bash these uh, three structures uh, I I basically used every piece from the, those three kits uh, and just just flared them out spread them out to uh, to make more uh, make bigger structures. And, uh, and so it hides. I've got one loop of track that kind of comes out of the helix and makes a wider arc. And I wanted to do that so you don't lose track of your trains. But then, then I had, I wasn't sure how I was going to see it. So I built this helix uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. And I'm, I'm just getting down to figuring out what to do with it. But it's the first thing you see when you walk in the door. So I decided to, I'll start dressing that up. But I'm I'm avoiding scenery because I'm still making a lot of sawdust every day, and uh, I don't want to clean up scenery, uh, clean all the sawdust stuff. It's it's hard enough cleaning off the track. Uh, Steve eighty seven PSF says, "Nice talk, Don. Funny, I got a building in your presentation. I am now part famous." <laughs> thank you, Steve. Don, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, sharing your kit bashing and kit disguising with us. And uh, well, thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. It was fun. It's all about humanity.